Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Inspiring Leadership Podcast. I am delighted to have Yossi Amram, PhD. And Yossi and I, in our earliest calls, I just realized this guy is exceptional in that he's very different, but yet the journeys that we've had in different ways have many elements of resonance. And I, 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 I love that saying, you meet people for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. And I certainly think with Yossi, I probably met him for all three and we're going to be in touch, I think, for a lot longer. I've been loving his book, Spiritually Intelligent Leadership, How to Inspire by Being Inspired. And I'm looking forward to having read the, the book. I'm also looking forward to listening to the audio version, particularly with things like visualization, various exercises you've got. That's a long introduction. Yossi, welcome. Great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm I'm honored by your warm welcome, and and I'm delighted to be here and watching your smile. It's very kind, and and uh, I feel received and met. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I I do feel a resonance with you, and and in all our chats via email and in person, it's been just a delight to connect. And um, so yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. We'll see where it goes. Exactly. And that's half the fun is is just to see to see where it goes. But in a way that's so useful to our listeners and those watching on YouTube, um, because this whole area of spiritual intelligence is always uh, fascinated by me. We both talked about Zohar's book on spiritual intelligence and also a mutual connection we have with Dr. Ruven Baron. Um, also, like yourself, um, was in the Israeli military. You were in the um, uh, in the Israeli Air Force uh, as a company sergeant major of an anti-aircraft unit, promoted very quickly at a very early age, almost a record speed. I've never come across people who've been promoted so quickly. But then you realize that that kind of culture, while it worked for the military, it really jarred in the way with how you'd like to do things. Then you became a CEO two different organizations um which you took through all their funding rounds and an ipo which is a huge achievement in its own way and and that's why I, I don't normally have coaches on but you're you're so different in that you've been a ceo ceos are my focus you've been a ceo two years and now you're coaching and acting as a psychotherapist to um some amazing ceos that makes it very interesting because people's dark side as well as their light side is fascinating but yeah congratulations on such a life and a career that you've had thus far tell us a bit about your life and how it sort of shaped you as the man you are today you see it maybe takes some five minutes on that it's over to you really okay thank you you've kind of touched on some of the highlight points so yeah i was born and raised in israel and like all young israeli men i was drafted into the military uh, despite my pacifistic leanings, but uh, and fortunately, I, I served in a period that was quiet, so I didn't have to deal with combat and wars, which is heartbreaking to see what's happening in the world right now. Uh, in Gaza, Israel, elsewhere, Ukraine, I mean, it's just uh, heartbreaking. But as you mentioned, I, I came in, I was actually a shy kid. I didn't think I was a great leader. I, I didn't have any notion of that. But somehow I had the fastest promotion record in the history of my regiment. I won all these leadership awards. And um, But despite my success, the command and control model chafed at my soul. And I felt like it, it was powerful and important in battle, but it really didn't help people necessarily actualize their highest potential. Uh, and so I, my overriding dream was to someday build an organization and lead it based on different values that that uh, support the growth of individuals. And that led to my first company that uh, I started, was called Individual Inc., was the first company to do personal newspapers. You'd get uh, your uh, Jonathan's personal newspaper on your fax machine well before the internet and we had machine learning software and you told us which articles were relevant or not and they learned about you it's kind of like the precursor to today's AI uh, this is in the late 80s early 90s before the internet anyway this was my life's dream and the word individual meant both the customization of the news but also the organizational philosophy that supported 
the growth of each individual and their uniqueness in a team context. So I was very passionate about it and I was very driven and and I worked and worked and worked 70, 80 hours a week. And then I kind of burnt myself out uh, and I experienced some kind of depression, dark night of the soul. And, um, you know, I, I managed through it and then the company went public and my stock was worth a lot of money and so on. But through it all, I in, in the middle of that away, uh, evolving from that darkened night of the soul, coming out of it, I experienced a spiritual awakening. And uh, that awakening shattered my my normal perception of our my separate sense of self. I was feeling like one with everything, including the ground, the, the floor. Uh, and I started to feel like the entire universe is made of consciousness, that it permeates and, and it's alive and I'm not separate from it. And that kind of blew my, blew my circuits. It just totally blew my circuits. And it resulted in a manic episode um, because I became so consumed with this vision and what it meant. And as a result of that, I was pushed out of the company that was my baby. And uh, our stock price got cut in half. There were headlines in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times about how I was emotionally unstable and so on. It was very shaming experience. I was cut off from um, you know, my network, the high echelon of Silicon Valley, venture capitalists and CEOs and so on. And people stopped responding, whereas I was kind of a, a star in that circle up to then. So it was a very painful experience, but it kind of changed the direction of my life. And I felt I needed to first prove myself again. I started another company and it was an in internet security and I took it public. And uh, but at some point I felt, OK, I've done enough in this. And I wanted to really understand what was the spiritual emergency that I had? What was that thing? And I started mentoring other CEOs and entrepreneurs and I wanted to work with them deeper. So I did change the direction of my life and went back and got a Ph.D. in in psychology. So I became a psychologist, a therapist. And in my research, I wanted to find out, understand what is this spiritual experience? What is this thing that I've heard the term spiritual intelligence that, as you mentioned, Dana Zohar first coined, but there was no academic research and operational definition about what, what that is and how to measure it. And so you mentioned your friend, Ruben Baran, who's done a lot of work in emotional intelligence. There's Daniel Goleman, who's done his own measure, and all this other research that's been done that showed that emotional intelligence contributes to leadership and lots of other places in life. So you have to define it, and you have to find a way to measure it to study it scientifically. And so absent that, and given my interest in spirituality and leadership and what happened to me, I decided to go and pursue this research. So I set on a path to define what spiritual intelligence is. First, it involved interviewing 71 teachers across all the world's traditions to find what's common about them. Is spiritual intelligence from the point of view of a Muslim, the same as a Jew, the same as a Buddhist, the same as a Christian. And what was really heartening and exciting was that there were common universal themes, regardless of the theology and cosmology and metaphysics of any tradition, you know, the basic virtues of purpose and service and compassion and gratitude and humility and integrity and higher self and intuition were hailed by all of these traditions. So that's kind of said, okay, there's something here that's more universal, that's not tied to a religion. And the good news is I also knew that in the field of positive psychology, these very same qualities have now been shown to co contribute to well-being. So that was very exciting. And then from that, I developed the first academically validated measure of spiritual intelligence, which then I showed contributes to leadership effectiveness. Leaders that scored higher on spiritual intelligence led teams that were more committed, uh, you know, uh, had higher morale and lower turnover. And that was after controlling for emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence were found to be complementary. Each contributed to leadership effectiveness on their own, but together they produce a multiplicative effect. And that was very exciting to me. And since that research, which is now 
over 15 years, over tw almost 20 years, others have done follow-on research and shown that leaders with greater spiritual intelligence actually produce better financial results in their organization. And there are many other benefits to spiritual intelligence. So that's all very exciting. And that's kind of what I'm um, dedicated my life to now is to help awaken greater spiritual intelligence in leadership and in the world more broadly. I think the humanity is facing such set of crises that existential crises that I think we need to understand our interconnectedness and our interdependence to to address it. And so I think this is this is crucial and I've made it my life's work. It's very timely. And and thank you. I mean the the, the passion that you have for this comes across in the way that you describe it and the way that you feel so strongly for it. And and I think it, it was very interesting that from an early age, when you, as a pacifist, you went into the uh, the Air Force and and were a high performer throughout. Uh, high performance is, is a theme, as I read your book and I got to know you, it is it drives you. And I, I wonder, where did that come from? Was it, was it, was it parents? Was it the culture you brought up in or is it just is it just within you it's your it's part of your sort of superpower that this power and then my next question is when you have such a drive there is going to be a blow up at some stage you just you just the it's just like ex explaining um as economists want exponential growth growth in a closed system the only thing that does that is cancer but they can't understand that it just doesn't doesn't work exponential growth in a closed system so yeah, just playing with those two thoughts, what drove you and and then there was going to be a reckoning, you know, just it, it, mm -hmm. that exponential growth just could, couldn't carry on. Tell me more. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just letting your word and your question wash over me. And it's touching because it, it's touching on some deep things and it's making me reflect deeper about my life and um so yeah, I mean, uh, part of it was my upbringing and my education, and there was kind of my parents always expected me. There was an implied expectation that I'm gonna do. I was an only child, and there was a lot expected of me. Then uh, some of that was healthy, and some of that was really painful to be an only child with so much expectations laid on me. And in a way, I rebelled. I was a lazy student in high school and elementary school. I barely did my homework. I was smart enough and got good enough grades, but I never worked. And then in the last year of my high school, uh, you know, the 73 war hit in, in Israel. So as I mentioned, I was lucky. I was drafted during peaceful time. But some high school friends got hit in the war and died. And that was kind of the beginning of me asking, what is this meaning of life? What is my life going to be about? And, and that got me on a, on a path of introspection and philosophy and psychology to understand the meaning of life. And then going into the military and, and the things I talked about. And um, so, you know, something in me awakened and said, OK, I have this one life. I don't know how long it's going to be. And I want to make the most of it. And I want to contribute. I want to experience as much as I can. And uh, so I ended up leaving Israel. I wanted to see the big world. I came to the U.S. And my path to entrepreneurship, I thought, was going to be through technology. I was good in science and math and so on. So I came to MIT, which was kind of the top engineering school. And I thought I'm going to be an engineer and invent something. And that will be my path to starting an organization and try these philosophies. Then I discovered that I actually, you know, uh, didn't want to be an engineer. I, 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 even though I was decent at it, I was like, I didn't want to sit in front of a computer or design circuits and write programs all day. So I became, I went to business. I decided to the path for me would be combined business and technology. So I went to Harvard and so on. So yeah, I was a fast track. I was going to all the places, doing great. Then I raised my comp, I started my company, I raised money and I took it public and all of that. But along the way, I burned out, you know, because I was so dry, driven. And, <clears throat> you know, I think it's humbling 
And I think it's the greatest gift when we fail, because up until then, we're like, you know, uh, I was doing all the, the great things, MIT, Harvard, military, fastest promotion record. I had, you know, perfect grade point average at MIT, you know, which which my family and I was proud of and so on. And uh, but, you know, it can get to your head and and uh, and it's disconnecting and it feeds our narcissism. So, you know, I had to face this dark night of the soul where I was burnt out and was pushed out of the company to really ask myself, what is this all about? It, it is fascinating. And, and, and I think in my own way, I, I relate in a different way, obviously, but um, in my early years, I was struggling and, and seemed to be the thick kid now transpires it was dyslexia and 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 that's proved to be my my superpower on you know doing hosting guests like you and others and just being interested in other people i remember my mother saying don't worry darling you know you you, you may not be good at maths or spelling but you'll be good with people and uh, this was some you know expectation from my mother but at the same time a bit like with your parents um Mother was widowed at 33 with a fast jet pilot husband who was killed in a plane mm -hmm. they gave him, which which was faulty, and it, the, the fault killed him, but he saved his co-pilot. Um, but there were still huge expectations from my mother that, you know, I was going to be a general. Um, so she couldn't be an admiral's wife and a lady, but so I would be a general. And I remember at about the age of 16 yawning loudly at table, and my mother goes, Jonathan, generals don't yawn. I go, mom, I'm not a general. I'm, I'm not even in the army yet. But, you know, she, the, the, the parents living vicariously through their children. I'm sure you'll, you'll have a field day as the, as the therapist with that one. But uh, it, it is interesting, this, you know, fast track that I had, like you had. And that it can make us very, as you say, very narcissistic, very much focused on our ego. And this is and some of the CEOs that I come across, they are terribly, some of them, not all of them, some of them have got their balance about right or their work in progress. But but there is this big I am and me and I'm a superhero. And, and it made me think about the fact that in perhaps Israel, certainly the UK, certainly the America, it's the heart of it, is this the individual, that the, the culture of the individual superhero avenger you know hulk whoever it might be superhero ceo doing it all working 78 hours a week until they blow up yet i'm ironically you've moved way into the sort of almost the eastern spiritual intelligence not religious spiritual intelligence but just the fact that i think you put it so beautifully that you and you'll be sharing your tip at the end about this concept of when you find your meaning and purpose and your passion and your calling, your vocation, your dharma, then you are inspired by doing that. And in turn, you gather interesting people in a community around you who also want to be working in a similar way. And you're creating more of what's the benefit to all of us and this interconnectedness that we're seeing so disjointed in tragically in the war in Gaza and the, her the, the her uh, uh, horrendous atrocities that were committed by the Hamas terrorists as they came in, the, the, the bloody battles going on with Ukraine and Russia and the uh, atrocities they do to each other, and any wars that, that uh, I've been involved in. You know, I was in uh, counter-terrorism against the IRA who fed Robert Narak into a mincemeat machine to to dispose of his body you know the stuff that people will do is horrendous so that's a long way of saying it's interesting how you began on the the cults of which en ends up in ego and narcissism of the individual but yet now through your own journey you're focusing more on the community and that we are all connected we're, we're all part of something much bigger but people forget that i i don't know it's a long connection of thoughts i don't know what comes up for you yossi well a few things first uh i was i was touched something about when you talked about your dad and how he gave up his life to 
save his co-pilot and it just it's tragic that you lost him but um so something about that really touched me emotionally i just want to name that um thank you but but yeah um with regards to this hyper individualism and then this uh, you know interconnectedness i see them as you know uh, ultimately we need both um we need the it's the yin and the yang i think you know the western culture particularly the us it's hyper individualistic and i got to be free to be me and if if it's all about individual freedom and i got to be me it can result in chaos there's no shared sense of destiny and and so on so i got to be free to be me is one side and self expression and self actualization i think that's super important uh, so I wouldn't say I'm like on the collectivist side where, you know, you, you, you know, surrender your thing to the collective and you, you have no personal identity or motivation or, you know, inspiration and, and uniqueness and, and so on. So I think we need that sense of individuality, but we need to have that sense of we're in this together and it's not just about me. And, uh, so I think we exist as human beings kind of walking this fine line between being a, a unique individual and being part of the whole, part of the one. And in physics, there is this particle wave duality. So things, you know, light is both a particle and a wave. And I think we as, as human beings are both individualized particles and a wave but that individual particle is not separate it's interdependent none of us can survive on our own we rely on so many other people you know and so many other things in nature i'm looking right now through the window and i see the trees as they take you know co2 and convert it to oxygen that that i can breathe so i'm interdependent with the trees, I'm interdependent with the farmers that grow the food. I mean, none of us can really exist, survive on our own. We're social animals. So yeah, I want to have my own unique expression in life, but I also need to recognize my my oneness with the, with the totality. And I call this sort of uh, a Copernican revolution that we as humanity need to experience, particularly on the West. So up until Copernicus, people believed that, you know, the Earth is at the center of the of the universe or the solar system. Because when you look at the sky, the sun moves across, you know. So you think the sun is revolving around the Earth. That's how it looks. But now we understand, no, the sun, the Earth is revolving around the sun and the Earth is rotating around itself. And all life on Earth comes through the energy of the sun, and that's kind of a Copernican evolution. or So our Galileo moment, if I may use that term, uh, that my friend Steve Farrell at Humanities Team uses, uh, is when we realize that, uh, you know, the, the perspective of the ego, that I'm a separate self competing against other individuals, other egos in a doggy dog world with scarce resources, is is a faulty thing and that's what's leading to these wars and 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 all of those and it puts me in adversity to fellow human beings it leads to jealousy and rivalry and and uh you know those kinds of things that we were talking about earlier so it's a long thing uh i'll pause there yeah yeah and and, and I, I i do love the, the difference between you know copernicus and and galileo that that to, to see things as they really are rather than as we'd like to imagine that everything revolves around us. And, and that takes me on to the work that you and I do with CEOs. And, and I found in your book, Spiritual Intelligent Leadership, really interesting when you took some stories of individual CEOs and what makes them inspiring and the journey. I think it was a lovely point you made when we were just discussing earlier. It's not no, no one's born as the finished product. Here is an inspiring leader. This person's born like this, and suddenly they grew up and just all the way through perfect being. Even even the Buddha, but you know, had his own problems beginning as a prince and then seeing all the suffering. 
and realizing trying different things from asceticism to to having had luxury and and found the middle way and and i'd love to hear from you about two or three of the ceos that you want to appreciate as inspiring leaders and, and perhaps you can bring it out for the ceos listening around the world about their journey a bit and and um yeah just just make make it specific for some of your clients that would be very interesting if you're happy to share that okay yeah i mean in general in the book i uh hide the identity of my clients with names and so on but these two or three i have permission to to mention their names and so on so i, I will take the liberty of doing that um so one of them is emmett uh emmett share who uh was the founder and ceo of twitch i don't know if you may have heard of twitch is um is a company that created uh, a platform for community for mostly teenagers and young young people uh, to connect around video games. And Emmett grew up very introverted, very cerebral, loved books uh, and reading and was kind of awkward socially, if I may <laughs> share that. And his his way of connecting was through video games, but he felt lonely and so on. And that was his way. So he started this company called Twitch that helped people, these isolated teens, connect with each other and, and form community. And so out of his pain of loneliness, he had this vision for how to create a platform to help people like him and others have a sense of community online. And he grew Twitch uh, to be, you know, uh, over $2 billion business with hundreds of millions of, of users over a 10 year journey, which I was blessed and fortunate to, to help and support him in. And along the way, he sold it to Amazon and made tons of money, et cetera, and eventually handed the baton to his successor and uh, then started working on on social causes because he's so passionate about community and he lives in San Francisco. He started working on things like housing and transportation problems in the San Francisco Bay Area because he wanted to enable his friends and other people to live in this area. Mo too many people were leaving. So, uh, but what what is what the ways Emmett is a great uh, spiritually intelligent leader is he's taken a pain point and has a compelling vision to um, that is really inspiring him to him and others to to enable people to to have a sense of community online. The other thing that's really tremendous about Emmett is his passion for truth and. Um, you know he's very he's very much devoted to truth, and uh, you know he's into debate and discussion, and and so he has little ego when it comes to you know ideas. So within his team, he has a, he's got a strong set of vision and ideas. But when others can come up with that data or reasons, uh, he's always happy to to change, and you know his his yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so one one more sentence about Emmett, and I could talk a lot more about that. Is um, well, I lost my train of thought. Go ahead if you have a clarifying yeah, question. It, 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 sorry to to um, catch yeah. you in, in the middle of the thought, but it, in your book, what I I found very useful is a number of the practical exercises that you give, and and particularly when you had, and it, it may not be Emmett, uh, but but other CEOs that you mentioned without mentioning their names that they had been massively successful, but but in some ways sometimes lost their way. And I think what was very helpful was the interventions where you perhaps got them to do a particular visualization exercise of what it was that they, it, they really was at the core, the essence of what made them come alive and feel that that, that was what they were supposed to be contributing on the planet. And, and when they get to the essence of what they're here to do, what they're in service of, then it, it almost transforms them. I, that came across very strongly. So well, I, mean, I just want to recognize you, Yossi, for, for that work. I think it is, it's a really important calling. And, and I think you might have done that with Emmett, but certainly with others. Does that have any resonance? Yeah, totally. So when we, when we, you know, feel 
into our hearts what is our deep desire, what is our high aspiration, and we trace it back to its source, it fundamentally comes from our spark, my, our sacred spark of life. And when we're in touch with that sacred spark of life, you can call it soul, you can call it your essence, you can call it your, your spirit, whatever, that 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 is a place when if you connect to that in your being it's it shifts it's it's not your familiar sense of self and from there you feel connected to other people to to the totality so to speak so then it's not about your ego anymore it's about that vision and and how it connects to your life force and when you're in touch with that life force that is calling you to realize that vision then you become a servant leader and and i have a slight twist on on you know greenleaf's idea of servant leadership um which is you know he focuses on being a servant to the people who are under you and that's to me is certainly a part of it but to me a servant leader is in service of the vision of the world they want to see and so if i am so you know, like Martin Luther King, he was a servant of a vision of, of human rights and equality around race, etc. So his life was about that, and he was willing to give up his life. It wasn't just about the people working for him. It was about that vision, and you, you're in service of that. Then, then, as Gandhi said, you reduce yourself to zero, and you become unstoppable because it's not about you. It might involve pain. I might lose my my life but i'm wholehearted working towards that and that's invariably inspiring and empowering because all our life force is focused on getting to that vision that set of values that mission and and what is so interesting as i listen to you is the huge amount of energy and passion that you have and and i i was curious as you've done your own studies and gone on your own journey and we, we, you, I took your questionnaire, which I found very interesting. Thank you for letting me do that. And I, I recommend it to other people too, if you want to understand about your spiritual intelligence quotient and, and how to uh, assess where you're at on your journey at the moment, um, that uh, ego was an area I needed to work on, um, which uh, I, I am well aware and continue to do that. But in your own journey, when, if I met the young company sergeant major or the young CEO of Individual Inc., were you as as energetic and as full on as you are now? And how do you how do you learn to really, you know, ground yourself, give yourself mm. more gravitas and pace, and and just slow it all down? I just wondered. I noticed. Yeah, that's no, a great question. I was pretty passionate, um, but I didn't have the maturity and the practices and the composure to ground myself, which is indeed exactly why I was pushed out of the company that I started, uh, because I had I had the spiritual awakening and the internet was happening. We went public, and I had this vision of where the internet was going and everything I saw actually happened. You know, people who pushed me out said, if we listened to your vision, all the initiatives you wanted to do, we'd be today like Google or like Facebook. And so I saw it all coming, but I wasn't grounded and I was very passionate and I wouldn't take no for an answer. And because I was so compelled by the vision, we had to do everything yesterday. It wasn't, and my team was like, hey, we can't move so fast. The board was like, hey, you can't do so many things. You're, and I was like, no. And then so I, my ego got hooked by this vision and the vision was right, but I wasn't grounded to, to, to your point. So, you know, and this is like, I call the yin and yang of leadership. The yang of leadership is, you know, having the enthusiasm, having the vision, follow me. That's the classical model of leadership. I see the thing, I run ahead, follow me. And that's leading from ahead, be, uh, in front. But then we have to do the yin of leadership, which is to lead from behind. And then we drop back and then we're supporting other people to, to find their way. And so, and that's a more facilitative role. So we have to have the maturity to to do both and the grounding and the awareness. And, and do you not, uh, I, I'm, let me not ask a yes, no question. I'm curious whether 
you had to go through all those experiences of being, um, you know, really driven and becoming quite manic about it uh, and being, I think, probably quite a tough CEO to work for. Yeah, I know many CEOs I'm coaching with who want it all done yesterday. Everything's priority one, which means nothing's priority one. They want it all done now, all done yesterday. Nothing's ever good enough. This makes you a great coach, mentor, therapist, um, teacher for others because you've seen the damage on other people when they are like this themselves. Now, of course, it's like... And the damage to themselves. Correct. It's like being a smoker who gives up. He realizes the damage to his own lungs, but also the contamination for people around him by passive smoking of inhaling his cigarette smoke. Um, yeah, it must give you an interesting perspective now to look and see people doing the very things that you were doing and to perhaps be able to help them in a way let me just tell you my story and and think twice about what you're doing because there are some consequences and and perhaps that's what i think you're able to do in reading your book and things help people understand the consequences and there are alternatives different journeys that they can go on it doesn't have to be this way what what do you think yesi yeah for sure i mean it gives me credibility that i i've been in those shoes and i can relate to it and i see the the downside and help people just not by lecturing them on the downside i've experienced but just helping them you know pause and reflect the the impact they're having on their team and uh how you know, it's kind of a vicious negative cycle where the more domineering you are, the more controlling, the more micromanaging, the more your team is disempowered and looks to you to do everything. And then you feel like, oh, they're not stepping up. They're not stepping up. So you you become more domineering and so on. So people need to see that, that dynamic and the negative consequences from an organizational performance. But then the second thing I do is to help them see how that isolates them. And that results in the certain loneliness and the burnout they experience and so on. So that's where being a psychologist, helping people realize, like you said, it's it's the, the second smoke, the second hand smoke and the first hand smoke. And uh and then people start to wake up like, okay, how can I do this a little different that's better for me and for the organization? Yeah, I, I, you've made me think of a couple of leaders I've been working with recently where I go, what would it be like? And, and I had Stephen Covey Jr., Stephen M.R. Covey on, who was a real joy as a guest. And he, I think he was episode 299. And his book, Trust and Inspire, I think you'd really relate to um it fits very much with the values that i have and we, we've had similar um uh, sort of um awakenings ourselves of how I, I look back at some of my command and control leadership and i groan when i think about how i did it and uh, <clears throat> but they they are going well I, I go have you thought about elevating and empowering your own team to to step up and you can then be more strategic and look ahead you know five years bit like on the Titanic, you know, there's one officer running around below deck, tapping the gauges and shoveling coal into the furnaces and um, sweating down below the decks and just being everywhere, doing everything. And then the other one's up on the bridge and he goes, five miles ahead, there's an iceberg, uh, one degree to port. Aye, aye, Captain, one degree to port. Okay, men, carry on. Thank you, sir. And, you know, the difference between the one on the bridge who can see and the one below deck who's just going to hit the iceberg and go, what was that? What was that? What, what happened there? I, the gauges didn't tell me that. I mean, the gauges were fine. We were doing great, top speed. What was wrong? And and that they find it really hard to get, well, people won't do it as well as me. I mean, I have to tell them, you know, I just have to set the standards. And and every time I, I let them do it, they, they get it wrong. They don't do it right. Not the way I would do it. And I go, yeah, but, you know, has anybody died? Well, no, but it's not the point. It's not exactly how I would do it. And I go, well, are you surprised they're upward delegating to you and everything comes to you and you're working longer and longer nights and evenings and weekends and your holidays, you take it all with you and your family aren't seeing you. They don't know the man you are. 
often the men, I'm afraid, some of the women, but often many of the men, or the women will sacrifice a lot of things. They might decide not to have families and to pursue their career. They don't want to have children, and it's a choice they make. That's fine, but there are consequences for them. I, um, are you seeing that kind of behavior a lot in, in your... Um... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the successful entrepreneurs that I've worked with and you look at, you know, start out with that drive and that uh, micromanagement and you you hear stories of of steve jobs or bill gates or what have you and it, it seems to be part of the uh, dna of of a lot of these personalities but you know the good ones uh as they grow and and they know how to learn to delegate and surround themselves and like you said, step to the to the deck and see where it's going. I mean, we have to understand that as leaders, you know, our productivity and effectiveness is not related to how many hours we work or whatever. It's related to what frequency and energy we transmit, how we articulate a vision that people are compelled by, and how we make the strategic decisions that, that are needed to lead our organization or lead our business or whatever context it is. So, But to, to make those right strategic decisions, we have to be resourced. We can't be burned out. We have to, to have insight, and that requires taking care of our ourselves in a way that gives us space to step back. I mean, Bill Gates, you know, used to take a week off every quarter or six months, I forget, where he would go into the woods, disconnect, and reflect on, and that's how he would reinvent Microsoft and build it. So he was a micromanager in some ways and had some of those qualities, and but he also was smart enough to to step back and and do that and you know if you read Steve Jobs I mean he was a micromanager etc but what very pe few people know is that the one book he carried on his iPad was um, a spiritual book about uh, what's his name um, God about enlightenment the the yogi uh, it just escaped me so he was meditating and he has all these quotes about his greatest insights would come when he would quiet his mind and rely on his intuition. And, uh, you know, so uh, so the, the best leaders, even if they start out with that, at some point they mature and they know that they need to build a team around them. And which is like why, why Jobs got, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? The guy who's running Apple now to, to, to um, do that management and and the stuff that he cook i think it was cook yeah tim cook i'm sorry okay. yeah 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 so um yeah no, that, that's 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 really good and and it is very helpful to see how um people need to if they're going to make that step up they need to elevate and empower others rather than suffering from founder syndrome which i see in a number of the entrepreneurs i work with um, where how they began is how they carry on. And that's why I say to new CEOs when they take in the role, remember the pace at which you're working in your first few weeks is going to be the pace you'll work at the rest of the time. Don't imagine you'll start fast and then you'll slow it down. It really is hard to do that and few do that. Let me just try a few almost like um, simple questions just for quick quick fire questions. I just want to take you around the Inspiring Leadership Compass, our, our own version, but we we resonate with a number of the the same values and and things that mark out high performing leaders using eq and sq uh, mq moral quotient um what did you learn when you let your values slip yossi what did you learn when you let your values slip well what i learned is that uh i feel bad about myself i i uh, there's kind of uh it's almost like a, an inner yuckiness, an inner disgust, like, you know, uh, and there's a contraction when, and it, it weakens me because when I, when I don't like, uh, behave in integrity with my, my values, then, then I'm misaligned. And when I'm misaligned, I'm divided. And when I'm divided, I have different parts pulling in different directions. And invariably it's like, you know, 
being on a boat, a rowboat, where different people are rowing in different directions. And so within my psyche, I'm divided and I'm disempowered. So when I'm aligned with my values, I am, you know, all in in one direction and all my resources and my mind, my heart and my belly and my my creativity and, and my passion are working towards the, the same thing. And that's just very empowering and and it's very harmonizing and coherent within myself. So there's peace, there's power, there's, and that just feels good. Uh, by the way, I remember uh, Steve Jobs' um, book. It's the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, so okay. that's the, that's the book that he had that he had in his iPad that he always referred back to. So uh, and it and, was it was a book written by Walter Isaacson, who who also wrote about. Um, um, Who's the SpaceX guy? Um, uh, uh, Tesla. Elon Musk. Yeah. Uh, Elon Walter Musk. Isaacson uh, talks about Elon, the Elon biography Musk. of the yogi in his book about jobs. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's a that's very full and very helpful uh, on MQ. And I really just then take it to PQ, purpose, meaning and purpose quotient, which is so key to everything with uh, spiritual intelligence. What gives your life meaning and purpose now? Well, it's basically to awaken greater spiritual intelligence in myself and the world. So as you pointed out, it's a lifelong journey. I'm still working on myself in all these qualities. So it's not like, oh, I wrote the book about spiritual intelligence and I'm done. I mean, life uh, continues to bring us uh, the same lessons until we 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 meet them and uh, and we learn and we graduate. The universe is, is incredibly generous. So there's some things that I'm still following falling into the same patterns and traps and i'm like oh okay here it is again and you remind uh, me if somebody told me once about the, the 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 different acts of life act one you walk down a street and you fall in a shitty hole and you go how'd i get in this shitty hole and you can't get out again and it takes a long time of sliming and crime climbing to get out of the hole act two you walk down the same street you see the shitty hole you still fall into it but you're able, you know how to get out of it now. Act three, you walk down the same street, you see the shitty hole, you go, ah, oh, shitty hole, and you walk around it. Act four, you walk down a different street. <laughs> yeah. I'm still, I think I'm still on act two, maybe on act three, but um, um, health quotient is an important part, uh, mental and physical health and well being. Um, how do you keep yourself healthy, Yossi? Because you're, uh, you and I are both in our 60s. Um, so so what is your top tip on this is my dog archie uh on keeping yourself healthy and uh, you know looking after your mental and physical health and well-being yeah well um i mean it's a discipline it's a practice i mean every day i i get up early i i exercise uh i go for i live i'm fortunate enough to live close to the ocean by the beach i go for a 45 minute walk on the beach and do some tai chi and yoga and get my heart rate and so on then i come and i have a, a yoga meditation room and i do some more yoga and prayer and meditation so i spend about an hour and a half a day on just physical spiritual and emotional exercise i do a gratitude practice in the morning and at night and the other thing is just to have loving connections. I mean, uh, the longest running study on, on human health is a, is a study that started at Harvard, I think 75, 80 years ago. And what they found is that people that had quality friends and relationships, be that romantic or otherwise, uh, did the best. So I, I noticed the, the affection you express with your dog and uh, whatever it is, we need to feel the love. We need to feel the connection. That's good for the heart. And uh, the more love we have in the heart, the more centered, the more nourished we are, the more gratitude we have, then we can we can radiate that out and we bring that energy and positivity. And then people, are, oh, I want to be around this person because they emanate well being and gratitude and generosity. And uh, so we become like a magnet and we're like the sun and water, and people are, are drawn to it because that's, you know, our employees grow and, and people that work around us grow when they feel that 
quality of presence of someone being attentive and caring and loving and grounded and present within themselves. So it pays off in the relationships and then the relationships nourish us and support our well-being and we can continue to pay it forward. I, I think that's so true. And um, I'm just thinking of uh, the love I have my wife, Lee, and for my four children and their partners and now grandchildren all appearing. And um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, no one says, I wish I spent longer in the office. If they do, they're very sad. Um, but they they go, it's all about my relationships with my, my partner and with my children or my family. And uh, it, it, it really is very important. Um, before we go on to favorite book and the top tip, which will round us up nicely, let's talk about EQ and um, just one aspect of EQ, but an important one and, and key in your job, Yossi. How do you listen well to other people? What's your tip about listening well to other people? Well, I think uh, first is grounding with myself and and becoming present and open i mean as uh, i try to remind myself as they say that uh you know we god gave us two ears and one mouth so uh i try to to be a, a good listener and sometimes i slip like you said i get impassioned someone says something i want to uh, put in my point of view etc but what i find is the most effective way to influence others is to make them first feel heard and you know and and do this practice of reflective listening so uh just did i hear you right i heard this did i did i uh did i did i get it correctly um so um yeah yeah, that, that's uh, so so very true. And uh, it is wonderful when you get a thoroughly good listening to. We can have a thoroughly good talking to, but getting a thoroughly good listening to. And you do know when you've been seen and been heard. And few people experience that in their lives. They, they really don't feel that they've been heard or their voice that can be heard. I, I do think of my wife, Lee, and the charity work she does with the Inspiring leadership foundation for women and girls who've been through some very very tough times and, and giving them the chance in life but the biggest gift to them is that they've often their voice has not been heard and they haven't feel that they've been seen in anything other than being objectified for sex or whatever it might be but to be seen in their own right and to have a mentor and a coach who who helps them believe in themselves is is wonderful and and that's a skill which you clearly have and i've experienced that when i'm with you um three more questions and and um one is executive teams um you work a lot with the individuals and their teams you've led teams what's your top tip to to leaders and your ceo clients who you've got to turn around a toxic team what would you advise them to do well, um, well, I think uh, a toxic team is a team usually where people's egos and uh, personal agendas are are dividing are divisive, and to me that's a sign of a lack of unified shared vision and alignment of intent. So what I would advise them to do is to to do an offsite and go offsite for a couple of days, someplace in nature, someplace that, that changes the, the the interactional patterns. Bring in a facilitator, um, you know, whether it's myself or other people. Uh, uh, I usually recommend others that do this, uh, and then um, try to get people to first you know, name what is the vision of the world they're all working to and get an agreement on that. And then secondly, what is the values that they all share about how they want to work together? Because without a shared vision of a future, a shared sense of purpose and mission, and without a shared set of values, you know, it's everybody's pulling into the different directions. So I think you got to reset, get people off site, into some kind of a retreat environment and uh, 
find their shared purpose, shared vision, shared mission, and common set of values. And then if people aren't signed to, up to that, then, you know, maybe they need to, to go elsewhere. But at some point, we got to be as a team and say, this is our shared vision. This is who we are. This is the world we're working towards. And this is how we're going to do it together. And if if we don't agree, then we shouldn't be working together. Yeah, and and I must admit, I um, just did uh, on offsite in Germany, which went incredibly well, and um, mainly because I'd just been reading your book beforehand, and it was about this idea of shared vision and values, and and I did. Um, well, we didn't do that particular exercise. What was so interesting was as they began to share more about themselves than they knew about each other previously, and. They saw the humanity in each other and what made them tick and the kind of roles that they liked doing. We used a, a, a team tool. I, I, I think I'm finding in the last two or three years, I'm getting a lot of CEOs who want me to take their teams on offsites. And it, it's like, it's a real joy. So it's, it's almost like I've always done them in the past, but but not to the level and the power which I'm now finding happens in an offsite where, as you say, you're finding more about them individually they they are looking for where they have commonality between them in the shared vision, values, beliefs. Uh, and, and it is joyous to see the energy that a team has and the mutual respect, which before they'd just been working in their silo, hitting their numbers. The numbers don't lie. Just I've just all I gotta do is deliver. And this concept of the first team, which is the team you report up to rather than your own precious my ring, my little thing like something from Gollum in Lord of the Rings, my ring, my team, my team. And and I, I I love seeing that. And it does take what is potentially a toxic team, makes it very healthy. Um, There's more we can say about that. And I can tell yeah. you about loads of ideas. But however, I would just ask you to name your favorite book and then we'll do the, the wrap up at the end. What What's a, a, a book you'd recommend apart from Spiritually Intelligent Leadership by UFC Emron? <laughs> Um, but but being free of ego as you're working on that one, uh, what would you recommend as a great leadership book? Well, I don't know that I would recommend just great leadership books. I would recommend um, books that, uh, you know, have to do with, with our own inner transformation, because I think that's, uh, and I'll just rattle off a few um, that I think, you know, are important for for our self journey. I mean, I think you and I mentioned the miracle of mindfulness and yep. Thich Nhat Hanh, and we need to be mindful of ourselves and each other and the dynamics of the team, just becoming more present. I would recommend, you know, Radical Acceptance by Tara Bra. Um, I would recommend Atomic Habits, which is currently a bestseller because sort of the, you know, reprogramming ourselves and, and, uh, you know, developing new habits in small incremental steps. James, James uh, Clear. Uh, yeah. Habits, yeah. Yeah. So um, those would be just some books that, that I recommend. Uh, that's good. That's good. I mean, three good ones. Miracle of Mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh. Radical Acceptance by... Tar Tara Brach. Tara Brach. Yeah. And Atomic Habits by James Clear. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could throw out many more that I. Yeah, I find, um, you, you, well, you're you're an avid reader, and and I know that the average person in America and the UK reads average one nonfiction book a year. So if you read two, you're an expert. <laughs> okay. So let's go into our closing piece. Um, would you introduce yourself? This is this stands in its own right uh beyond the podcast but as part of the podcast would you introduce yourself talk about the book you've written and the work you're doing a little flavor of the fact you've been a ceo before it would be great and then your top tip in two minutes you'll see you've got two minutes How wow, about wow 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 okay <laughs> <laughs> slow and <steady. laughs> So I'm Yossi Amram. I'm a psychologist, executive coach, and an author of this book, Spiritually Intelligent Leadership, How to Inspire by Being Inspired. I work with and have coached over 100 CEOs, many of whom build companies with employees in the thousands and revenues in the billions. And uh, as you can tell from the title of my book, I believe the, the key to becoming a powerful 
empowered uh, leader is to get inspired first and foremost ourselves. And that means finding our life force and the vision of the future that we want to build. And what is our vision? What is our value? What is our sense of purpose? And then, you know, getting that energized and enliven us so we can share that with others and then draw others who resonate with that vision. And when we do that, we have a community of people that are aligned around that shared vision, mission, and values. And that's the most powerful thing in the world i mean it's been said uh you know what bring a, a group of people that uh have a belief in the impossible that's the only thing that changes the world I, i'm i'm kind of butchering a, a quote a famous quote here fantastic well look yes Amram, thank you it's been a real privilege having you on the podcast as I say, I've enjoyed your book. I do recommend people uh, read it and listen to the audio version, which is coming out soon. I'm looking forward to that. And, um, you know, this is one of a podcast that comes out every week. So please listen out for our other amazing guests like you'll see. And if you like it, share this episode that you've heard with your friends and put a comment on Apple or Spotify or on YouTube to help other people get benefit from it. Because it's about sharing the wisdom and the experience and the spiritual intelligence. So Yossi, thank you for being our guest. It's been a real privilege. Likewise. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been a delight. Thanks, Yossi.